Will European astronauts one day fly to space in a space capsule developed in Europe on top of a European rocket? Or will they be forced to buy tickets on a commercial provider from the US, China or India? It's a bit of a messy situation. Let's talk about why. Hello everybody and welcome. Last week I went to ESA's Ready for the Moon conference in the historic center of my hometown Vienna in Austria. Over the course of four hours various panels discussed the importance of spaceflight to the economy and society and how Europe fits into all of this. Or rather, will fit into the ever-changing landscape of spaceflight. All of this was quite interesting and on top of that I got to do an interview with ESA astronaut reserve member Carmen Posnik. That is going to be a separate video and it's going to be a good one, so make sure you're subscribed and receive notifications so you won't miss it. A big part of ESA's conference was discussing the findings of the so-called high-level advisory group on human and robotic space exploration for Europe that published this report in March. Revolution Space – Europe's Mission for Space Exploration And it's surprisingly candid in many parts. Already in the fourth paragraph it reads In the past 30 years Europe decided not to invest in leadership and autonomy in human space exploration. Instead it chose to pursue collaboration as a junior partner with NASA and until a year ago with Russia. Look where that got us. Oh yeah, and there's the main question. Europe must decide what role to play in this revolution. Spectator, customer or leader? Which is kind of answered two times. First by stating that more than 100 lunar missions have been announced by 2030, with Europe only leading two of them. And also there's, there's this graphic here comparing the US, China and uh, Europe in regards to capabilities in space. Basically the first two got low Earth orbit covered. Oh, and <laughs> India will be there in a few years as well, while Europe has contributed a module to the ISS. It's even worse when we look at the lunar portion of the chart. Then again, the authors are a bit generous with the green dots next to human landing system and lunar surface large logistics. Not sure how they define leads, mastered, but so far none of the factions listed have any hardware flown for either. I am not going to go through everything, so you can go and read the reports uh, yourself. It's available on ESA's website in PDF format. I will put a link in the video description. But suffice to say, the report and also the conclusions of almost all panelists during during the conference were pretty clear. Europe needs to get into gear when it comes to human space exploration. While ESA is quite good at Earth observation from space and has launched some pretty impressive deep space exploration missions like Bepi Colombo and more recently JUICE, it is severely lacking in the transportation department. And this is a problem, because if you look at history there is a common thread. After the first frontier activities, transportation infrastructure was put into place and shortly after that, some people that had the foresight to get in early on that business got filthy rich. Here's my personal take on what's going on right now. I believe we're standing on the cusp of a space transportation revolution. SpaceX has proven that rapid reusability is not just feasible but also highly profitable. They have basically cornered the commercial launch provider market. It's a bit like Falcon 9 is a steam engine, while everyone else is still using horse-drawn carts. And if Starship can keep even half the wild promises SpaceX CEO Elon Musk made about it, it's going to be another big step forward. We have seen concepts from Ariane Space that emulate Falcon 9 and also some copycats coming out of China. However, and this is something that was said repeatedly by the experts during the conference, if you just run after the ball, you will never win the game. You need to anticipate where the ball will be and be ready to intercept it there. Or the puck. One of the panelists apparently was a hockey player. 
So, what has Europe been doing in the game of space transportation? Ariane 6 is behind schedule and is de facto just a cheaper version of Ariane 5 with no added capability and, even worse, no reusability. We had the Hermes space plane concept decades ago that never flew for real and was cancelled in 1992. And most recently there was the SUSE concept presentation by Ariane Space. SUSE stands for Smart Upper Stage for Innovative Exploration. And I kind of ripped it apart a bit when it was first presented because it doesn't really make a lot of sense on quite a few levels. At least not to me. I will link to that video below, please go and watch it if you're interested in the technical details on that concept. And let me know if I'm completely wrong in my assessment, comment below here or over on the other video. Where does that leave Europe? When that transportation revolution I mentioned really kicks off, where are we going to be? There is supposedly a trillion euro economic potential waiting in space. Or 400 billion? Or 200 billion? Well, it depends on what study you cite. But the main thing is, there is a whole new line of businesses waiting up there. I'm not just talking about space tourism or communications like Starlink or OneWeb. Zero-G manufacturing is going to be a thing. Orbital construction as well. And also lunar mining and manufacturing. We have barely scratched the surface of what's going to be possible up there. Will Europe be able to take a big piece of that trillion euro pie? Or are we going to be left the crumbs? When the ISS is going to be decommissioned, where are our astronauts going to fly to? Yes, there will be the gateway in lunar orbit, but it will be smaller and rides to it will be few and expensive. At least at first. Uh, there are going to be commercial space stations. Will ESA have to rent a module like any other customer? Or will we be able to add our own research module where European astronauts can perform experiments, while space tourists look over their shoulders? The report closes by postulating a bold goal. Independent and sustainable European human landing on the Moon within 10 years. So, European astronauts launching aboard European spacecraft, launching on European rockets, landing on the Moon in European landers until 2033. That is ambitious. <laughs> we don't have a new human-rated rocket. Ariane 5 is done and Ariane 6 is still far away. We don't have our own capsule that could send astronauts to the Moon. Susie is too much vapor rare at the moment and there is nothing else in sight. However, there is the European service module for the Artemis missions, which provides propulsion and life support for NASA's Orion capsule. So we do have know-how and hardware for that part of a moon mission. There's the Argonaut lander, but it is still a concept and can only send roughly two tons of cargo to the lunar surface. It isn't meant for crewed missions. While those are all big obstacles, I know that Europe has the brain power to solve all of this. As do India, China, Russia and the US, of course. It was never a lack of smarts that prevented other nations to get into space. It was a lack of political will, money and experience. The US and China have all three now and are in a race to see who will set boots on the moon first. Russia has lost the first two due to their focus on outdated imperialistic land grabbing by starting a senseless war against Ukraine. India has the political will and appears to be finding the money. They are currently developing the experience to get their Gaganyaan spacecraft flying. From what I've read, there should be two test flights this year, with a few more in 2024 until the first crewed flight at the end of 2024 as well. But probably more likely sometime 2025, if all goes well. Before Europe can also gather the necessary experience to send astronauts into space on their own, we first need the political will and funding to do so. 
And this is what ESA Director General Josef Aschbacher has been doing since he took the position, drumming up political support for a stronger European presence in space. If we're being honest, the entire Ready for the Moon conference was aimed not at you or me, but at the politicians that will decide on ESA's budget. This also becomes apparent when you look at the members of the high-level advisory group we talked about in the beginning. There's politicians in there, a former NATO secretary general, artists and professors. Peers, if you will, of those people that shaped the future course of ESA. In November this year, heads of state from 30 countries that are members of the EU, ESA or both will come together at the Space Summit 2023. And the decisions made there will define what role Europe will have in the coming space revolution. Will it be going to lead it, like the high-level advisory group demands, or will it just sit on the sidelines while the United States and China divide up the moon amongst each other? I have been a bit harsh in the current state of European spaceflight for most of this video, if we're being honest. There's a reason for that. I am pathologically impatient. Yes, me, the guy who can suffer through hundreds of again retries when something fails in Kerbal Space Program without complaining. The reason why I am impatient here is this. I want more competition in space. I don't just want one or two nations to decide the fate of humanity up there. I don't want just one company to rule the entire launcher business. Humanity's strength lies in diversity, not monopoly. And I believe we already could be much farther in many regards, not just what's concerning Europe. That's why I tend to get frustrated when I believe things are moving along too slowly. Which I think is the case with European spaceflight. But one of the main takeaways for me personally, and where I think I need to do some personal growth myself, came during the panel on the societal importance of spaceflight. One of the participants cited a study saying that the younger generation has less hope in the future than those before them. And suddenly science communicator Thomas Rosek abruptly cut in and said, no wonder people don't believe in the future if we always tell them everything is lost. That was the only time during the conference where the entire room broke into spontaneous applause during a panel. The only time. I have to admit his outburst resonated with me because we tend to give up so quickly nowadays and focus on the negatives. And yeah, media out there, if it bleeds it leads, that's not the only way how to make good content. And yes, building rockets is hard. Making spaceflight safe for humans is hard. Landing on the moon is even harder. And all of it is hugely expensive. But can we afford not to do it? It's the same thing with climate change. If we give up and say, it's already too late, we're never going to fix that, then of course we won't. It's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And you know what? Screw that. Keep fighting for the future because otherwise there won't be one. It's a bit of a tangent, but in the song Ablaze, Alanis Morissette sings about her children and ends the chorus on My mission is to keep the light in your eyes ablaze. I think way too often we are dimming that light by focusing on all the bad things happening, by pointing to the mistakes and failures instead of on how we could make things better. There's a lot of good in this world and there's even more to come. If we work for it, if we keep the fire ablaze and show those that come after us that yes, there will be a future for them. It's our job to plant the shade trees that our grandchildren will be able to sit under. Everything is not lost. To come back to spaceflight and finally close out this video. Even if Europe is behind other players right now, it does not mean it will have to be that way for all eternity. As I said, we have the brain power. There's currently work being done on the political will. And then it is a question of money. Which is going to be hard when all of these other matters around us need financing. But from my perspective, putting money into space projects is like investing into Apple when they first released the Apple One. 
people 45 years ago will have told you that you are crazy. Not so crazy now. Europe cannot afford to not invest more into space and into human spaceflight, to be more specific. Therefore, some pressure on the policymakers all around Europe might be necessary, so they will make the right decisions come November. If this is something you care about, find out who in your government is responsible for space stuff and message them that they should vote for more money for ESA and focus on the development of human launch capabilities. Keep that light ablaze. Oh, and rocket engines too. Lots of them. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel for more and follow me on my social thingies. The links are in the description. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.